if you've got your Bibles with you, you can open up to chapter 16. We're going to finish that up and go into 17. Uh, we're almost done with these plagues and these uh, judgments that's been put on the earth. We've got over two more of them, and that will be the last of 21 judgments that God is going to rain down on the Christ rejecting world sometime in the future. The uh, sixth and the seventh bowl judgment will be the last two. And then in chapter 17, we're going to uh, look at the rise and fall of a false one world religious system. And in chapter 18, we're going to look at the rise and fall of a one world uh, evil economic system. And then we get chapter 19, Jesus comes back to set up his kingdom here on earth for a thousand years. So let's get on through this rough stuff and we'll be looking at great stuff starting chapter 19. It's been a long road of uh, judgments been pouring down on the earth. All kind of crazy things have happened. Um, a lot of people, a lot of Christians have been martyred. Uh, a lot of people are forced to take the mark of the beast if they're going to continue to buy, sell, and trade. We've been told if you take the mark of the beast, you pretty much have sold your soul to the devil or you're getting it back. So in chapter 16, we're going to look at, uh, we're going to pick up at, at verse 12, and I'm going to work my way on through this and explain to you what's happening here, and then we're going to go on into chapter 17. So verse 12, the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings up from the east. Then I saw three impure spirits that looked like frogs that came out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. They were demonic spirits that performed signs, and they go out to the kings of the world to gather them to battle on that great day of God Almighty. Verse 15, Look, I come like a thief, blessed is the one who stays awake and remains clothed, so as not to go naked and be shamefully exposed. Verse 16, Then they gathered the kings together to that place in Hebrew that is called Armageddon. This is the only time in the Bible that the word Armageddon is used. Uh, this Armageddon, you probably heard about it all your life. It is the final battle. The final battle where God comes and He intervenes and He destroys all His enemies. This happens at the second coming of Jesus Christ. I preached on the second coming Sunday. Remember I told you there's two parts to that. There's the rapture of the church at the beginning of the tribulation. At the end of the seven years, there's the revelation. That's when Jesus comes back and actually sets foot on earth and destroys his enemies and sets up his thousand year reign here on earth. Now, back up a little bit about this sixth judgment, this bold judgment, where these impure spirits that look like frogs, and a lot of this is symbolic. It says they come out of the mouth of the dragon. We know the dragon is Satan himself out of the mouth of the beast. The beast is the Antichrist and out of the false prophet. These three are the unholy trinity. And now, these three are, have such demonic powers that they let these impure spirits out of them to go and entice the kings of the world, the known world at, at this time, to come and wage war on Israel. They entice them to uh, uh, form an alliance together to come and destroy God's people and God's country. God's country is Israel, no doubt. Now, think about that, how that would apply today. How demonic spirits influence our government. Do y'all believe in that? Yes. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, right today we are seeing the same thing happening right before our very eyes. Demonic spirits are influencing our government in this country, and especially in some of the other countries, Iraq, Iran, where the crazies are, they don't care, you know. Um, these, uh, this religion called Islam, these Muslims who are, are for sure are demon possessed, and we're going to talk about Islam a little later tonight if we get that far, but 
This is happening right now, and it's going to happen even worse later down the road. Now, we're going to talk about this great battle that's going to happen in the end. I'm going to back up and show you some scripture in Zechariah and Ezekiel that talks about this war and what will happen. Um, basically, we're told in scripture that Jesus comes and destroys them with the word of his mouth, the sharp double-edged sword, which is his word. Jesus don't need a bomb, he don't need a tank or a machine gun or anything like that to destroy his enemies. Just his word will destroy it. Look at verse 17. Now, we know that the sixth bowl has prepared the way for the kings. It has uh, sent these spirits out and it's enticed these kings to start forming an alliance to all start hating Israel worse than they hate them now. But they will uh, be all these countries coming from the east and coming from the north, Russia, Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, Iran, uh, China, a bunch of them will form an alliance and come down on Israel. Verse 17, the seventh angel poured out his ball into the air and out of the temple came a loud voice from the throne saying, it is done. Then there came flashes of lightning, rumbles, pearls of thunder, and a severe earthquake. No earthquake like it has ever occurred since mankind has been on earth. So tremendous was the quake. The great sea split into three parts, and the seas of the nations collapsed. God remembered Babylon the great and gave her the full cup of the wine of his fury of his wrath. Every island fled, and the mountains could not be found. From the sky, huge hailstones weighed at least a hundred pounds, fell on people, and they cursed God on account of the plague of hell because the plague was so terrible. First, we see the armies gathering up to come to battle. Then we see the result of the battle. We see what's happened here when uh, Jesus is just speaking and destroying his enemies. Now, back it up to where. You notice in verse 19 it said the great split city split in three parts. And we know the great city is what? What do they want to destroy? Jerusalem. Israel. Jerusalem, yeah. Israel. If you back up to Zechariah chapter 14 and start in verse, let's see, 3, it reads like this. Now this is Zechariah prophesying about this great battle of Armageddon. And also what I want to tell you is this battle will take place in uh, the, the Megiddo uh, Valley. It's actually the, the Jezreel Valley to the Kidron Valley. I don't know if you're familiar with all that area over there, Chris. I know. But it's this huge, I watched a DVD on it. It's a huge valley, 180 miles long. It's said to be the perfect spot for war. Um, Napoleon stood there one day and said how he would love to be able to fight a war in this valley. It's just set up perfectly for a great battle. But Zechariah chapter 14, starting verse 3, it says this, Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as he fights on, a battle, on the day of battle. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem. Now, you've always heard when Jesus comes back from the end of the uh, tribulation, he will sit down on the Mount of Olives where he left from. Remember in Acts where he ascended into heaven? He ascended from the Mount of Olives and the uh, angel said he will come back just like he left. He will touch back down on the Mount of Olives. Here it is, right here in Zechariah. And, let's see, and the Mount of Olives will split in two from east to west forming a great valley. Now you notice up here it says the great city split into three parts. See how the, the prophecy aligns with what's happening in the future? Forming a great valley and half the mountain moving north and half moving south. Now, if you also go over to Ezekiel chapter 38, <clears throat> Ezekiel chapter 38, I'm going to read, let's see, 14 through 23, I think, what I'm going to do. Yeah, 14, 23. 
Now this is a description of this battle in the future as Ezekiel is uh, prophesied as the Lord is giving him a vision of this battle. Starting in verse 14, Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say to God. Now God is a, an ancient term for a group of nations uh, clustered together of evil nations. Uh, say to God, this is what the sovereign Lord says. In that day when my people Israel are living in, a, in safety, will you not take notice of it? Will you come down from your place in the far north? You and many nations with you, all of them riding on horses, a great horde, a mighty army. You will advance against my people Israel like a cloud that covers the land. In days to come, God, I will bring you against my land so that the nations may know me when I am proved holy through you before their eyes. Verse 17, this is what the sovereign Lord says. You are the one I spoke in of in former days by my servants, the prophets of Israel. At that time they prophesied for years and I will bring you against them. This is what will happen in that day. Now this is what will happen in that day of this great battle. When God attacks the land of Israel, my hot anger will be aroused, declares the sovereign Lord, and my zeal and fury and wrath I will declare to them. At that time there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, Remember what we read earlier about the great earthquake? No earthquake has ever occurred since mankind has ever been on earth. Verse 18 of Revelation 16. Uh, the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the beasts in the field, every creature that moves along the ground, all the people on the face of the earth will tremble at my presence. The mountain will be overturned, the cliffs will crumble, and every wall will fall to the ground. I will summon a sword against God on, on all my mountains, declares the sovereign Lord. Every man's sword will be against his brother. I will execute judgment on him with plague and bloodshed. I will pour down torrents. Remember about the hailstones I just read in Revelation? Listen to this. This is way back in Ezekiel. I will pour down torrents of rain, hailstones, burning sulfur on him and on his troops and on the many nations with him. So I will show my greatness and my holiness, and I will make myself known in the sight of many nations, and they will know that I am the Lord. Now that's Ezekiel prophesying about this great battle that's going to take place. And Ezekiel prophesied about it years and years ago. And here we are, John, getting the word straight from Jesus Christ to record in this book of Revelation about this same battle that is going to take place in the future when everybody comes against Israel. You know, if you read about the nations that, that they list that are going to come against Israel in that day, you know, we're on, down here in America, our area is never mentioned. Never mentioned. As long as we remain in alliance with Israel, our nation will be okay, so to speak. But once you get out of alliance with Israel, remember what God, uh, God told um, Abraham, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. So that kind of wraps up 17. Now, I could go into all kind of detail about this great battle, but basically it's called the Battle of Armageddon. That happens at the end of the tribulation period, at the end of the seven years when Jesus comes back is what's called the revelation when he goes back and he touches down on the Mount of Olives he will destroy all these nations with the sharp double-edged sword or the word of his mouth. In other words he can just speak them out of existence just like that. So he will stand up for his people. Now that ends all the judgments. That ends all the 21 judgments. We don't get through each and every one of them. But before we get to the end of the tribulation, or before we get to Jesus actually coming back at the end of the tribulation, we have to back up. Keep in mind what we're going to look at in 17 is not chronologically in order with what we just done. We just finished out the seven-year tribulation. 
with chapter 16. We just finished it out. We got to the end of it. We got to the last bowl of judgment. That finished it out. We got to the battle of Armageddon, which marks the end of the tribulation. Now, in verse 7 and chapter 17, these events happened in the first half of the tribulation. So we're going to back up and we're going to look at the rise and fall of a one world false religious system. We know that the church gets raptured up prior to the tribulation. Probably pre-tribulation rapture. Can't nobody tell me any different. The majority believe that. What is the dominant religion? Right now, Christianity is the dominant religion in the world. Whether you believe it or not, it is still the dominant religion. With Christianity out of the picture, not completely out of the picture, but the majority of Christians out of the picture at the rapture of the church, what will be the dominant religion left on earth? Islam. Islam. Keep that in mind as we look at this one world religious system tonight. Islam will be the dominant religion left on earth. Now, like I've told you, have been telling you all along, I said it again Sunday, there will be people who get saved during the seven year tribulation. Because God sends a witness to prophesy uh, to, to spread the gospel message. And people will get saved. Most of them that get saved will be killed for their faith. Some of them will get through the seven year tribulation uh, as Christians and go into the thousand year uh, millennium reign of Jesus. Alright, 17. Now, this stuff is complicated. It's going to sound complicated. It is complicated. So try your best to keep up with me. I'm going to try to explain it the best I can. Chapter 17. Listen. One of the seven angels who had the seven balls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits by many waters. Let's stop right there. The great prostitute represents this false one world religious system that the false prophet himself will start up on earth uh, during the seven year tribulation. Now, when Christianity is gone, people will be, people are going to always be looking for some sort of religion to follow. When Christianity is gone, my belief is Islam will take over. It's trying to now, and it's not far from uh, outweighing Christianity now. But I don't believe it will ever outweigh Christianity until after the rapture of the church. So the great prostitute stands for the false religious system. The many waters, what would that stand for? Remember, all along through this study, I've told you what the sea represents. And I've always told you the best commentary of the Bible is the Bible itself, right? Let the Bible speak for itself. Okay, if you look quickly over the chapter, to verse 15 of the same chapter, it explains what the many waters are. Remember, I always told you the sea represents people, nations, and languages. Verse 15, then the angel said to me, the waters you saw where the prostitute sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. So what we got here is this great prostitute or this one world false religious system uh, being influenced around the world because it sits on many waters or many nations, many peoples. That's symbolic of it taking over the world. With her kings, with her the kings of the earth committed adultery and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of, of her adulteries. Now, I need to, um, we'll, we'll talk about it a little further down. Verse 3. <clears throat> then the angel carried me away in spirit to the wilderness. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and seven heads and seven horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold and precious stones and pearl. Now, this speaking of this woman with all these, the glittering of gold and precious stones and all that, it is a 
representative of this one world religious system being backed by lots of money and power and greatness. Islam is backed by lots of money at them. So think of the oil and stuff from these countries that can be sold and pumped into this religious system that will be teaching, uh, uh, that will be taking over the world at the time. <clears throat> the name written on her forehead was a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes, and the abominations of the earth. Now, let me stop right here a minute. You know, we need to talk about Babylon, Babylon the Great. Now, Babylon, do y'all remember back in the study of Daniel, King Nebuchadnezzar, and his great city of Babylon. The, at that time, it was, a, uh, it was a world empire, and they went over to Israel and invaded it three times and took off most of the Jews back with them. And they uh, took Daniel and uh, a bunch of the other ones, you know, back. And that's where Daniel wrote his book uh, that we studied before this. Now, Babylon always in the Bible represents false religion or idol worship or satanic uh, satanic government. Uh, anytime you hear Babylon mentioned in the Bible, always remember it represents this false religion or idol worship. It's all demonic, all no good, all anti-God. Outside of the city of Jerusalem, Babylon is mentioned in the Bible more than any other city. It's mentioned some 300, and plus, 300 plus times it's referenced from the book of Genesis to Revelation. The city of Babylon is talked about 300 plus times. Like I said, outside of the city of Jerusalem, Babylon is talked about the most second. Uh, scripture teaches us that Babylon was destroyed, but also Scripture teaches us that Babylon will rise again in the future. It will rise uh, as a great city again, right out of the ashes where it was destroyed. It will be rebuilt to its former glory, and it will be the home or the, uh, the, uh, the uh, I would just say it, where the Antichrist, or the base of, for the Antichrist, where he performs and leads the world, that will be his home base, the city of Babylon that will be uh, rebuilt. King Nebuchadnezzar brought, brought Babylon to its, uh, its glory and it was considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world with its hanging guards. Y'all remember that? It was thought to be this city during the reign of Neb King Nebuchadnezzar was thought to be impenetrable. Hard word to say. In other words, they thought that it would not be penetrated. This city was 87 foot thick, and third, the walls were 87 foot thick, and the walls were 35 stories high. Can you imagine how monstrous of a city this was? They, it was told, and it was said uh, just through archaeology and uh, ancient history writings. That the people of Babylon could live inside of this city for 20 years without ever having to go outside the walls for food or water. We know the great city, the great river Euphrates, flowed through the city, a constant, uh, a constant supply of fresh water. Also, the great river Euphrates was the downfall. If y'all remember when we studied Daniel, um, the Medo-Persian Empire dammed up the great uh, the river Euphrates, it dammed it up, and they walked right up under the wall of the city and they captured it without even firing a shot. They didn't have guns at that time, as you understand the philosophy here. They walked, they dammed it up, walked right under the city wall and captured it. Listen to this. 150 years before this, Isaiah in chapters 45 through 47 prophesied about the capture of this city and he even named the king, the Persian king that would capture it. 
150 years before this king was even born, Isaiah said King Cyrus will be the one, the Persian king, that captured Babylon. And it happened just like he said it would. Isn't that awesome that God can perform such prophecies so accurately? 150 years before the guy was even born, Isaiah prophesied he would be the one to uh, capture Babylon and take it over. And I told you about the Medes and the Persians damming up the Euphrates, going under the wall and capturing it. And they did this on October the 12th, 539 B.C. So the Medo-Persians captured it. Then uh, after that, uh, the Greece, Greeks come, Alexander the Great come and captured it again. Then the Romans, and the Romans ended up destroying it, and it lay in action. We know the scripture says that it will be rebuilt again in the future and it will be returned to its former glory and that will be the home base of uh, the Antichrist and his demonic world leadership. Well, there's been one character that tried to uh, rebuild it to its former glory. Y'all know who that is? Back in 1990? Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein back in 1990 set out to, he understood the scripture and he thought he was the one that was supposed to bring it back to, it, to its former glory and he set out to do just that. He built his palace on the original foundation of King Nebuchadnezzar's city, his palace, his great city that was walled off. Saddam spent $500 million building his palace on this foundation. But he got greedy and he tried to invade Kuwait. Sanctions broke out. Uh, we put against him. And eventually, war broke out. And I think he was part of that war. And he was captured and he was hung, correct? So that ended his little, little reign of trying to rebuild his city. So he was not the one to rebuild this city. The only one that's going to begin to rebuild this city is the Antichrist himself. He will have unlimited unlimited supplies of money, whatever he needs to rebuild a city, and that he will do so. Now, about Babylon, you need to know about Babylon because it's important. Babylon represents all evil. How did Babylon ever get started in the first place? Does anybody know? Does anybody know? If you back way, way up to Genesis chapter 10, Genesis chapter 10. We meet this character named Nim Nimrod. Nimrod. He was the great grandson of Noah. Uh, Genesis chapter 10, verse 8, it introduces us to Nimrod. Uh, it says, Cush was the father of Nimrod, who became a mighty warrior on the earth. He was mighty hunter before the Lord, and that's why they said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The first centuries of his uh, kingdom were Babylon. Then it goes on to tell, talk about other places he went and built. But anyway, Nimrod was the first one to uh, uh, come up with the city of Babylon, and, and he built this city. And if you go over to chapter 11, we're told the story of the Tower of Babel. I know most of y'all know that story. Well, in this same location where he had started building this city, at that time, the people on the earth only spoke one language. And this is the beginning of Babylon now. Now, Nimrod, where it says he was a mighty hunter for the Lord and all that, that doesn't mean that he was on the Lord's side. He was actually anti-God. He hated God. And if you go and uh, take some of these words that are, are some of this language here and convert it back to the Greek language, you find out that when it says it's a mighty number before the Lord, it's more than saying he was in God's face. He hated God. He did everything against God. And in chapter 11 of Genesis, we see where they, uh, it says, now the whole world had one language and a common speech. And people moved eastward. They found 
and plant a ship, Shinar and settle there. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used bricks instead of stone and tar and mortar. When they come, so come let's, let's build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heaven. What they did was they tried to, uh, or well, they actually did, they built this great pyramid with a flat surface on the top. Uh, this pyramid went way up, 7, 800 feet tall. And what they were trying to do, they weren't actually trying to reach God. They were trying to reach the stars. These characters of the time, uh, this four light, different languages on earth, there's only one language, they worship astrology. The occult can all be traced back to this right here, the uh, worship of astrology. What they try to do is reach the stars so they can get up on top of their tower and worship this moon and the stars and the sun and all that. They didn't want anything to do with the God of the heavens. They were not trying to reach the heavens. They were trying to reach the stars. Now, God saw what was happening, so he did what? He confused their language. He confused the language when they all couldn't communicate together. So what happened is he confused the language. They stopped the building of the tower and they spread out then because God had told them to spread out and they never would. They ganged up and built this city of Babylon. It's called Babylon back then. That's the original Babylon. It started out as evil and it always stayed as evil. Anyway, when he confused the language, they all split up and they ganged up into groups uh, that spoke the same language. And that's how we got all the different languages we got on earth today. So where did you say that um, they tried to reach the stars? Pardon? Where they tried to reach the stars? I'll have to go over and find that for you and tell you about it next week because I didn't read that far into it. But uh, I'll find it for you and let you know. But right now, let's back back up to where we was at in Revelation 17. You've got a picture here of what's happening with Babylon, the rebuilding of Babylon, and here this world, one world religious system will be based on Babylon. I just want you to uh, understand that. This one world religious system will uh, uh, have an effect on the whole known world at the time. They will be backed by tons of money and supplies, whatever they might need. Um, verse 6, it says, this is one of the verses that makes me think that Islam is going to be this one world religious system. Listen to that. Verse 6, I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of God's holy people, the blood of those who bore the testimony of Jesus. Now, what's that symbolic of is these people who belong to this one world religious system didn't think twice about killing Christians. They were drunk with the blood of saints. What does the Quran say about Christians? The infidels. Either convert them or kill them. Right? You can't convert them or kill them. That's just what the Quran says. You can't convert them or kill them. When I saw her, I was greatly astonished. Then the angel said to me, Why are you so why are you astonished? I will explain to you the mystery of the woman and the beast she rides, which has seven heads and ten horns. The beast you saw, you saw once was, now is not, and yet will come out of the abyss and go to its destruction. The inhabitants of the earth whose names have not who have not been written in the book of life from the creation of the world will be astonished when they see this see the beast because it once was, now it's not, and yet will come. The beast represents the Antichrist. Always the beast of the sea represents the Antichrist. It says he once was, how does it go? Once was, now it's not, and will uh, and will yet come. Remember back when we were first introduced to the Antichrist, uh, it talked about him being killed and resurrected from the dead. He tries to copy everything that Jesus does. 
Remember that? We studied that about the Antichrist uh, being uh, his type. The way they, the word in the language they use is, I was wounded and his arm was uh, mangled. Anyway, that was symbolic for death. Anyway, this is what this is talking about again here. He uh, once was, now is not, he dead, and yet will come again. This is the uh, death and resurrection of the Antichrist, where he does this in front of the world so that the world will follow him. And say, wow, this man, he, he died and he resurrect, he's resurrected. Let's follow, just like we know that Jesus died and resurrected, and we follow him. The people of the world at that time were called the Antichrist. This will be one of the reasons. This calls for a mind of wisdom. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. They are also seven kings. Five have fallen. One is and the other has not yet come. But when he does come, he must remain for only a little while. The beast once was, now it's not. And the eighth king. And he is an eighth king. He belongs to the seven is going to his destruction. Now, 9 through 11 is very, very hard to understand. Here's how I'm going to explain it to you. You got to remember where John was at the time of this writing. <coughs> he was on the island of Patmos. What was the dominant empire at that time? Rome. Rome. During the Roman rule, the Roman Empire. So he's doing this writing at the time of the Roman Empire. Now, the ten horns you saw were ten kings. Now, I've reviewed this with you tons of times about the ten horns and the ten kings. Sometime in the future, the world, the known world here, our globe, will be split into ten regions. Don't know when it will be, but it will happen because it's, it's told, it's prophesied. It will be split into ten regions with ten kings. Now, at that time, the Antichrist himself will be one of those ten kings. Keep that in mind. This is before he comes into full power. All right? They will receive a kingdom for an hour. That means for a very short time. Let me back it up. Let me back it up to, <coughs> to verse 10. The seven heads are seven heroes on which the woman was set. There are also seven kings. I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. They are also seven kings. Now, from the time John's writing, there had been seven world empires ahead of that of the Roman Empire, or actually including the Roman Empire. There had been seven, and when the first Roman, uh, Roman, I mean world empires, it's talking about world empires that had influence on Israel. That they had to have some influence on Israel. In other words, they, they would capture Israel or something to do with Israel. At the time of this writing, there had been seven of them, seven kings. They were Egypt, Assyria, Babylon. We know that uh, Daniel was taken to Babylon during the that time of the Babylonian rule. Then the Medo-Persians and the Greece. Uh, in Greece, Okay, it says five have fallen, that's the five I just named. One is, the one who is, the one who is is the one who is at the time of this writing. So who is the one is? <coughs> the one is, and the other is yet to come, but when he does come, he must remain. For only a little while. So the one he is is Rome. The one who is yet to come is the Ten Nation Confederation. As it says that will only remain for a little while. This Ten Nation Confederation holds together to make this seventh one. Now, <clears throat> moving a little bit more, the beast who was and is not is an eighth king. So who's the beast who was and is not? Daniel Christ. He will be the eighth king. Because out of the ten nations of preparation, the beast will come to be uh, the eighth king because the other kings will actually not give their rule over to him. And we're going to look at that a little later. It tells us that they all just give their rule over 
number two lane. Now, we're going to have to stop there, and I'm going to finish this up next week and move into chapter 18, but I'm going to back up again and explain it all to you again, because it's very complicated, and if you haven't studied it, it takes more than one time a year to understand it.